morning. Today's reading is from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I hadn't figured out if having a bunch of young grandchildren around you makes you feel younger or older. <laughs> if you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, Lord, for the laughter of children, the blessing and heritage that you've given us. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you, Father. Lord, open up our eyes to see the truth of Jesus, to our ears to hear the words that you have for us, Lord, that, that Jesus Christ would empty himself and become nothing so that he could die for our sins that he would humble himself below the creation that he created to suffer and die, to be mocked and to be persecuted, all because he wanted us to be able to be put back into a right relationship with you, Lord, to be adopted as your very own children. So we thank you and praise you, and we ask for the joy of laughter in our hearts to know that we are saved, Lord, that we may live a life of obedient uh, uh, belief, Father, set apart in this world that it will be a light shining to others, especially by the deeds that we do, not just the words that we say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I ask you, I be, or if I say to you, I beg your pardon, what would you say next? Wow. Yeah, I never promised you a rose garden. Some of you wouldn't get that at all, but that's what I think every time I hear that. I beg your pardon. Next thing is, I never promised you a rose garden. It was a song by Lynn Anderson that became popular all over the world and everything that, that the, I did date myself, that was not a new release for her. It was released prior to that. Um, didn't do that well. It was released by a man, but then Lynn Anderson at the last minute, she liked the song and her husband had some involvement in the song and she wanted to put it on the album. They said, no, that's not the kind of song that a woman sings. But it's the truth, isn't it? Isn't it the truth about marriage that we marry for better or for worse in sickness and health till death do us part? I never promised you a rose garden. But yet so many people believe when they get saved everything's supposed to be perfect. They like that prosperity gospel. They don't want to open their ears to the truth and we don't gain huge attendances by telling people that you took an oath to deny yourself, take up your cross and die. So I entitled this, I Beg Your Pardon, but I also entitled it Begging for Truth because you should want to see the truth. There's a lot of begging going on in these uh, verses that we're reading now, a lot of begging on, on the water for, for G Jesus to save his disciples, begging by the demon-possessed men to be released from the depression, De begging by the people for Jesus to leave the region. A lot of begging going on. But I beg your pardon, the truth is we are disciples of Jesus Christ. He didn't promise us a rose garden. He said in this life there will be suffering, but blessed you will be if you suffer because of me. Paraphrasing there, but you understand the verses. So a little bit of review. Jesus had been teaching all day. We learned that in Mark 4, and he was exhausted. Evening approached. He got in a boat, told his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Matthew sets up the story a little bit more, so I'm going to read a few verses in Matthew 8 first. Verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. 
Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. So when we have these different accounts in the different gospels and you're studying, you should definitely go read the other accounts to understand more. It had been a long day and many people were following Jesus. We know there were crowds. We know there were the Pharisees and the teachers of the laws opposing me. We know there was demon activity going on. We know all of these things from Scripture. And there were disciples that said, Yes, I want to sign up. I believe. But they didn't believe in the truth of the gospel message that Jesus Christ was preaching. They wanted that rose garden. They didn't want a relationship different. They wanted Jesus to take care and cast out the demons and give them bread, but they wanted physical bread. They denied the bread of life. So disciples, well, if you notice here, there was the crowd first that was there. Then a teacher of the law came and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And then there was another disciple so we've got all different aspects of people that have come to see who Jesus is. And as we're reading Luke's gospel, Luke has clearly pointed out who Jesus is and in his writings is, is writing to him now and saying, my Lord, letting you know that. And he's giving an orderly account so that you know that all that you believe so that you will go and live like Christ in this world when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When Jesus has gone to heaven preparing a place for you, that you'll be his hands and feet here. Remember Luke wrote Acts of the Apostles. And Acts of the Apostles are the way that the apostles, the disciples, the people live, the believers lived because of Jesus Christ. They lived differently, set apart in this world, totally different than the world around them, even under facing persecution, which helped to increase their faith, not decrease their faith. And the end of Acts is open-ended because this is our story continuing. The thing is, is not everyone that cries out teacher or Lord or even master is a true follower. Are you a true follower? Remember Luke's account, Luke writes, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Why would you ever think that? And if that was the case, then you know that you, especially now we know that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that if we die from this earth, it's just ushering into eternity into heaven. So why would we fear death? The way the story unfolds, we, we can assume that Jesus had been teaching with his disciples in mind, and this trip across the lake was a further teaching instruction. It was also a time of rest. As he gets to the other side of the lake, we do see the demonic activity. We do see the uncleanliness of the land, and, and Jesus cleanses the land, so to speak. But it's more of a, a teaching, as you're reading Luke, it's a teaching example for his disciples that they need to increase their faith. Because there are journeys that they need to go on. This is before Jesus sends them out and tells them to go out and cast demons and everything. This is all before this. And this is Jesus' first real encounter that we read about with Gentiles. And there is that sudden typhoon that comes up on the lake. Enough that it would make sailors squirm and be wondering if they're going to die or not. I just have to think that maybe this storm, because some of the storms that you will face in your life are more spiritual than they ever are physical. Jesus was asleep in the boat. Maybe the demons knew that he was coming to the other side. Maybe they did not. We don't know what they know or don't know. We know that when uh, the devil tempted Satan, he left him for a more opportune time. We know that many babies upon babies were killed because they didn't, because the enemy did not know who the Savior was at that time. But now Jesus, the world knows who he is, and he's being attacked by demonic activity. And maybe, just maybe, this storm had something to do with that. I'm just saying maybe. I'm not putting any more on that. But we definitely know that this came apart to be a teaching example. It wasn't just by coincidence for his disciples. And Jesus, when he awoke, was very upset, said, where is your faith? I know you have faith. What have you done with it? Why do you have such little faith by this point already? We're going on a missionary journey to the other side, and you lack the faith that you need to have by this point. And then it got calm when Jesus 
spoke to the sea, which of course was for our benefit again and told it to be quiet because the sea doesn't have and the wind doesn't have ears to hear, but we do, and eyes to see what Jesus did, that he is the master of all creation because he was there in the beginning. He's there in the end. He's the Alpha, the Omega. Boy, when it got calm out there on the middle of that sea, which would be uncommon for, for that sea also, as glass. Don't you think the rest of that trip during the night you could hear a pin drop? What were they thinking? What were they whispering to each other? Well, we know they were saying, who is this man who commands the winds and the waves? So they're definitely having a time to think, to be quiet, to listen, to be still, to listen to God's voice. And they have no idea what they're supposed to expect on the other side of the lake. So continuing on in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. When he arrived at the other side of the region of Gadarnes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. There were, they were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all of this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. So let's look at Matthew's account first. It gives us the least detail here, but, but it gives us a big point of detail that you won't get. Otherwise, there was two men. We hear the story of one man, and the focus is on that one man because he believed and he was a true disciple of Jesus, and he made a difference on the other side of the lake. We don't know what happened to the other man. We know that the demons were cast out from him. We know there's another story about a bunch of lepers that were cleansed and only one came back. This man saw the power of God. His disciples saw the power of God. If you remember, there were more disciples than just the 12. There were several boats. We don't know how many disciples went over, but this is a further teaching example because we're going out and doing missionary work somewhere else because you guys are going to be sent out. You're going to be missionaries in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Do you understand this? Oh, and you need to have more faith in what you have right now. I know that you have saving faith, but do you live by faith? And faith without works, guys, is dead. Do you believe? There's nothing wrong with me needing to have your faith increased. Ask Jesus, and he'll increase your faith. So there were at least two men that were demon-possessed. And they came from the tombs, a place of death, to meet Jesus. They were vi so violent that no one could not even go that way. And they cried out, verse 29, What do you want with us, Son of God? Now, as we read the encounters more, we'll see that Jesus is talking more to the demons than he is the man. But he's talking to the man also. The reason that he came was the man, not the demons. The demons know their appointed time, and that's what's pointed here in Scripture. They know that they have freedom to do things right now, but then they will be sent to the abyss forever. But mankind has a choice to make right now. Their, their fate is sealed. But the men have a choice to make. And let's be honest, a lot of the problems we see in this world again are fighting spiritual forces. And we don't know how to handle things like that when we see those things. When we see a crazy person, we just want to think they're a crazy person and we don't know what to do. There are places trained to do that, and that's true. But the church is supposed to be able to handle some of these things also. And what if some of these things are demon possession? And what if there's a legion of demons? Are you ready to do that? Do you have the faith to do these problems? Or do you back away from it and say, Ah, oh, I didn't sign up for this. You got in the boat to go to the other side, didn't you? Do you not have faith? Is Jesus not the master of everything? Does he not have authority over demons, over everything else? 
And I know this is scary territory. But the man knew he came unless he was totally empowered by the demonic activity. He knew that this was the Son of God coming. Maybe he had been crying out in prayers. And the demons knew that this was the Son of God. What was the question that the disciples asked back out on the water? Who is this man? But yet this man in pain knew who this man was, and the demons knew who this man was. This is Jesus, the Son of God. Some distance was a large herd of pigs. We don't know how many at this time. We don't know how many demons at this time or anything else. But we notice the demons, verse 31, begged. That's why I said there's a lot of begging going on here. They begged Jesus, if you drive us out, well, we're going to read in a minute, we already know they were already told to be driven out. If you drive us out, send us into this herd of pigs and don't lose the story and go thinking about, well, can animals be possessed and all these things? That's not part of this story at all. And so many people look at it this way, oh, and human rights. Did you ever think people would be more upset about pigs being uh, dying, a large herd of pigs, than a two human beings being set free from the oppression that they knew they'd had for years and they lived in the tombs? Oh, just wait till Christmas time and turn your television on and see more ads about taking care of dogs than you do human beings. Don't be surprised the world we're in. We're in a world where people care more about the things of this world, including animals, than they do human beings who are being oppressed and hurt. And these are the marginalized. And how do we as a church deal with them? So Jesus said, go. He gave them permission. They came out and went into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Now we can learn a little bit about, more about where the, this actually took place because we've got a name and we know the steep cliffs. And if you know the area, again, there's really only one place that that's going to be on the other side of the lake. Okay? And they died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into town, and reported all this including what happened to the demon-possessed men. So we see this story. The disciples have the story of the winds and the waves, but the, the point of the story of the winds and the waves is not the storm, not that I was feared for my life. It was the point that who is this man that calmed the waters, that calmed the winds? And here is the point here. Who is this man who sent the demons out of these two men that we knew they were out of our control, so they were banished to the tombs? Who is this man? That's the point of this. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, notice not the men at this point, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Why? Okay, a lot of answers there, and we'll get into more later. Probably the biggest one people want to point to because it just makes sense is because they were unclean Gentiles and they had pigs and Jesus wanted to clear them out. And these pigs were their livelihood. Probably. But that's not the point of the spiritual battle again. The spiritual battle is waging over your soul. Who do I believe Jesus is? And am I willing, if I believe, to lay down my life, to deny myself, to consider myself dead in my trespasses and sin, a new creation in Jesus Christ, to live for Him, sanctified, set apart, not doing the things that I did before, and getting in the boat and going to the other side of the lake where I have no idea how I'm going to fight these spiritual battles, but it, maybe that's where Jesus is leading me. And that other side of the lake may simply be your neighbor across the street, guys. It doesn't have to be across the world. So let's go to Mark chapter 4. The story's actually in chapter 5, but we're going to start in Mark chapter 4 again. Verse 40, He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. They were more scared than they were of dying of Jesus calming nature. Him saying, Be quiet. And all of the chaos in the world went calm. Verse 1 of chapter 5. They went across the lake to the region of Gersenes, and that's a different word, and if I didn't pronounce it right, I did the best I can. <laughs> it's different than Matthew's, because we're dealing with, we get noticed later, that there's a whole bunch of cities there. So G Jesus just wasn't going to, to spread the gospel message to just one city, one area. He was doing it to a whole region, but he went because of one man 
two men, but one, I guess, walked away. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us. <clears throat> when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. That implies that they tried to bind him before. They put him in jail. What do we do with this problem again? There's this crazy guy in town and we can't get rid of him. We don't know what to do with him. So let's chain him up and see what happens. But he breaks the chains. And he does this repeatedly, evidently. And this is really crazy because men shouldn't be able to do this. So we got no explanation for this. And we're not going to explain it spiritually because hey, we don't want to do that. We don't know why he did this. But he's okay when he goes and lives in the tomb. So just let him go live there. And everything will be all right because he's not bothering us. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. So they must have tried ropes and things first, right? Verse 4, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And I've got to assume this is the same way with the other guy. I don't know. But Mark is writing the counter of this guy that, that Jesus made a difference in his life. Verse 5, night and day. Right there, you ought to cry. If you have any compassion about you, you ought to weep for this man. Because night and day he was persecuted. He never found any peace. Sure, if he's over there, I don't have to see him. But night and day these demons kept persecuting him. And you have the power and the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven and we fight a spiritual battle. And yes, when we start talking about demon oppression and stuff, but we've already encountered this several times in the Gospel of Luke already. It's a scary thing for us. But it's not an uncommon thing. Why do we want to dismiss it so easily? Do the demons go somewhere in this day and age and they're not bothers now? Or are they just as active in everything we see and hear and do? And are they oppressing people? But we want to say instead, oh, well, if they didn't go down the bar and they didn't do this, well, maybe that's where the demon activity is coming from. Where's the demon activity coming from in your life? Because Jesus warns you if you sweep a house clean and you don't keep it clean, what will happen? Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now this sounds like a psychological problem that we have today of cutting with people and stuff, doesn't it? Maybe there's more to that than just a chemical imbalance or something in your DNA. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. So maybe if we were just willing to get in the boat and people saw Jesus in us, maybe if we went to that person, they would see Jesus in us and it would calm them. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Now, we don't know if this was the man again or if this was the demons, but what we do know is that's an act of worship. No doubt. They kneeled before the King of kings and Lord of lords because he had authority and power, which Luke has been setting up in his gospel. They came to meet him. They fell in worship. He shouted at the top of his voice. Okay, now this is clearly because what it says is it's the man, but the demons, is it clear? I don't know. <laughs> what do you want with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Maybe it's the man. It sounds like the demons, and most, most of your commentaries say it was a demon, but what if it's the man? What do you want with me? Nobody wants anything to do with me. I am beyond help. So what do you want with me, Jesus? Well, let me tell you, I love you enough to lay down my life for you. That's what I want for you. You're worth something. You're created in God's image. I know that you're being persecuted, and I've come to help you rather than to cast you aside as society does because we don't know how to handle these problems. Maybe it was the demons because they knew it wasn't his time, their time. What do you want? What they do know is that this is Jesus, Son of the Most High God. And what does that say? Okay, well, there are principalities and powers and, and Michael is an archangel and so forth and, and I don't know the hierarchy of all that, but I know Jesus is Son of the Most High. High God. 
Lord God Almighty, and this is his son in human form. And I know that that son in human form laid down his life willingly to save his sheep. Do you understand that? Now we know it's the demons. In God's name, don't torture me. At least we think it's still the demons here. Maybe this man thought that Jesus was coming to torture him still because no one else cared. Why would Jesus care? For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Okay. Now I know Jesus is talking to the demons and has compassion for the man. I know that without a doubt, and I hope the man understood this. When Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. A legion at that time, at the time of Augustus, was 6,100 foot soldiers and 726 horsemen. 6,826 fighting men. Now, was there that many demons? I don't know. Scripture doesn't say that. Because again, it says that's what his name was. So it meant it was a large force. But what it did mean is the demons were saying, we know why we're here. We know why we have authority and power at this time. Because we are a military force waging battle against the souls of human beings. And maybe we stayed on the other side of the lake. We knew the Son of God was on that side. Maybe we wanted to just keep on tormenting these two men and the rest of the town that relied on the, whatever they relied on for their faith. Well, what we do know here is that he used a military term. Verse 10, and he begged Jesus again and again. I told you there was a lot of begging going on. Not to send them out of the area. See how it's different than Matthew's? At first, they didn't say send us into the pigs. They said don't send us out of this area. We're happy here. If our purpose is to wage war against the souls of men, we're happy here. We've tormented two men beyond anything human recognizable. And the town has just said, okay, we're fine as long as you stay over there because we're fat and happy sitting in our easy chairs enjoying the money from our pigs. Boy, now we're sounding a lot like this country, don't we? And maybe even the church in this country. Because we're content. We think things are fine. The demons are over there. But we're not doing anything about them and we're relying on these other things rather than Jesus and Jesus alone. Verse 11, a large herd. Okay, now we know it's not just a herd, but a large herd of pigs was feeding in the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus. There's a lot of begging going on. Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go unto them. He gave them permission. They could not do that unless Jesus gave them the ability to do that. Whatever Jesus said to do, the demons will do. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd's about 2,000 in number. Now we get an actual number. That's a lot of pigs. That is a big pig business. They rushed down from the steep side of the bank and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the towns and countryside. So they reported it everywhere. They didn't know it, but they were spreading the gospel message. Didn't even know it. Because they were saying every time that they went along... And this man, Jesus, is the one who expelled the demons. You remember that guy and that other guy that we had problems with for so long? Jesus told the demons. We didn't know it was demon activity, but Jesus told the demons to be gone, and they were gone. We saw all this. I don't know what it looked like. I cannot even imagine. But I think I would have been scared a lot worse than I was out on the water. I mean, drowning in the wind and waves is one thing, but demonic activity flourishing all around me and the pigs screaming and yelling just like the men were screaming and yelling, I cannot imagine. But the people, the, the ones attending the pigs reported this in the town and the countryside, everywhere, and the people went out to see what happened. They all went out to see Jesus as a result of what happened. What's the purpose of what happened? A man was set free. Two men, but one of them realized it. Verse 15, when they came to Jesus, oh, look, this is totally different than Matthew's, but the same, not a, not a contradiction. They saw the man. Matthew didn't point that out, but Mark did. How can you not see the man sitting there? 
The man that all this time we know we had all this problem with, he was out of his mind, now he's in his right mind. He was running around like a lunatic, now he's sitting. And what is he doing sitting? He's worshiping Jesus and listening to him and can't take his eyes off of him. But what about me? What about you? What did we come to see? We came to see someone that could destroy our livelihood, that could change the world and topple things upside down, and I'm not ready for that. When they came to see Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legions of demons sitting there, oh, I forgot, dressed, he was naked before, and in his right mind. And they were afraid, just like on the boat. They feared. But this fear is to draw you to amazement of who Jesus Christ is. That reverent fear in God and who He is and the power that He has created you and you sinned against Him and yet He sent His Son to die for you because He wants you so much to be with Him for all eternity as His very own child. Verse 16, Those who had seen it told the people what had happened and the demon-possessed men and told them about pigs as well. See, he writes it as a sidebar. Hey, all this stuff happened. Oh, yeah, and the pigs, they died. But yet the pigs seem to be what's important to the people in the town. At least that's what it seems like. I don't want to go do this. I don't want to do that because of this. But what matters is a matter of your heart, is it not? Two things seem to be important here. The man's healing. They looked at him, saw it and pigs dying. Who would ever dream that pigs would be more important? But like I said, just look at your world today. What should we be concerned about? Every single human being. Because when they die, they face Jesus Christ and face judgment and will be found as a sheep because they've listened to his voice or a goat. And how will they hear unless those who have sent out have been shod with the preparation of the gospel to go out, which is part of your armor for spiritual warfare. Verse 17, Then the people begged, or began to plead, in this case, with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, though, the man who had been demon-possessed, the man, because we don't know about the two at this point, um, begged to go with him. More begging. But Jesus did not let him, but said instead, here's what Jesus said, listen, go home. Not go anywhere else on a mission field, but go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Go home. Where was the man's home? He didn't have a home. We don't know how long he had been this way, but for a while, because he had been chained numerous times over and over again. His family had rejected him and stopped coming to see him. They had wrote him off. Don't you think he's going to be estranged when he goes back to his family? Don't you think they're going to be in fear of him? Would you want to go back? Wouldn't you want to go somewhere different and not have to go back and face those things again? And remember, you were out of your mind, you were naked, and you, and you ran around babbling and crying out and cutting yourself. What was your welcome like going to be when you got back home? But you're told by Jesus to go and tell how much the Lord has done for you, how he has had mercy on you. Mercy, nothing you did to deserve it whatsoever, but Jesus saw your pitiful state and did something about it. And then later in this story, and you already know this part of the story, we know that Jesus died on the cross for you in your pitiful state because he had mercy for you. That while we were Christ's enemies, he died for us. Verse 20, so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, the ten cities, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Don't we see this constantly in Scripture? They were amazed. They were amazed. They were amazed. Well, there's got to be people that go out and tell of the things that Jesus has done in their life so they can be amazed, but then you've got to decide what to do with that amazement. 
Because you realize that Jesus is not just an ordinary man. If you have some knowledge, you can share with them that there's not an empty tomb. You, you can tell of the things that Jesus did, and no one can deny all that. And the Gospels are cohesive in what they say and do. And everything else, and everything in the Old Testament points to God, even though it's written a span over 2,000 years with how many different authors and everything else. And it all points to Jesus and God's love for you. Isn't that amazing? But what do you do with it? Who is this Jesus? Luke chapter 8. Where is your faith? Verse 25. He asked disciples in fear and amazement. They said to one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I've got to be thinking at this point, how much do I obey? And what does this fear cause me not to obey? Why do I have more confidence in the fear than I have than in the faith that I have in Jesus. Verse 26, they sailed to the region of Gersanes. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You know what that word means? I love when I do word studies. It means reward at the end. Who would have ever guessed that? What was the reward at the end of this trip? The man being healed and the increasing of my faith. Because I see this man's life changed. That he did exactly what Jesus said, like the winds and the, and the waves. I know this trip back, when they're going back, they've got to be talking about this. Remember that time when I, we didn't obey him, Peter? Remember this time, John, when we didn't obey him? Because that man just went off and obeyed him. Oh, remember when Jesus said, the one that had been forgiven more loves more? Remember that? Remember when Jesus said that? Remember when Jesus taught a parable about a farmer sowing his seed and he sowed it everywhere? He even took 25% of his seeds, if you want to use mathematics, and, and put them onto the hard soil, which nobody, everybody knows nothing's going to grow there. But he did anyway. And 25% on the seeds on the rocky soil that when the things come along that make you question your faith, you die out. Oh, and the 25% of the seed on the, with the, the weeds in it, to get choked out and don't live a life even though there is growth? Or are we going to be like the 25% of the seeds that fell on good, and good soil of noble heart and produced a crop? Because we've got to travel in that boat back to the other side with Jesus. We have more to do. Just like this man has more to do on his side. When Jesus stepped ashore, he met a demon-possessed man from the town. That puts an identity to the man again. He used to be an active part of the town. For a long time, though, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, so he had a house at one point, but he lived in the tombs. What happened to this man? We want to go out and blame. We see the person out there again that's crazy, that's holding the sign, that's doing whatever they're doing, and we just want to blame it on whatever. Who were they before? Were they not a Chi someone's child? Where are their parents now? Were they not someone's brother or sister, possibly? Did they not have a home that they lived in? Were they a father or a mother or anything else? And what happened that, that put them in this state? Or do you care? You're just satisfied with the state that they are now. They're crazy and they're homeless and it's a problem. What are we going to do with them all? Do you turn your back and walk away or do you have compassion? When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? That one sounds kind of more like the man, but who knows. But then, I beg you, don't torture me. James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one. Good for you. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Oh, foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is worthless? The, the disciples have got to be thinking, why did they get in the boat at this point? What is going on? But the demons knew, just like the winds and the wave knew, that Jesus had complete authority and power over them. The man, from best I can read and decipher in my own thoughts and processes, as God reveals his spirit to me and his word, was hoping because he saw Jesus from afar. He had some hope even in that state. At least that's what I want to think. 
because I don't think the demons have enough power that we can ever not think on our own to have the hope because God has given us the ability and reason to do that. He has created us in His image. Jesus is Lord and Master over everything. How about your life? Luke 8, verse 29, For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. Notice it says many times it had seized him. So that means there was a time when the demons didn't have as much control over him or at least passive. Maybe he had some thought process. Maybe he had a word he could say. But who's he going to say it to? Another homeless man that was there with him that's crazy too? Because no one else was going to come see him. Verse 30, Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Oh man, boy, they're prophesying now because they know the end result is the bottomless pit. They know exactly where their fate is. Do you, son of man, know where your fate is if you don't believe in Jesus Christ and die in your trespasses and sin? That word means literally a deep and bottomless pit. They were confirming prophecy in the Bible. They were giving their testimony. Remember before this when Jesus has demonic encounters, he won't let them speak because he doesn't want their testimony. But here the demons are allowed to give their testimony. Is it to increase the disciples' faith, to increase this man's faith, to put him on mission? Verse 32, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank in the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Luke says it again. What scared them so much wasn't seeing Jesus, was seeing what Jesus was able to do in this man's life. What does that say to you? Your testimony is the biggest thing you can go to give to others. And even though they might not believe it, you say, I once was blind, now I see. I once was dead, now I live. I once didn't believe, now I believe. I might have did this, now I don't do this, so we've got to have that sanctified life. But they're listening to your testimony, and that's what scares them. Because Jesus is real to you, or He's not. What do your children see in you? What do your brothers and sisters, your parents see in you? Do they see Jesus Christ? Do they see a true faith in you? Do they see a faith that is compassionate to others in need, at least for the least of these? Isn't that why Jesus came? To set the oppressed free? Verse 36, Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed men, man had been cured. They went out and spread the gospel message even though they weren't believers. They told the world what Jesus had done for them. God will be glorified, and He will be glorified through His Son, Jesus Christ. And every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. In heaven, on earth, and did you notice in that scripture that Mark read, below the earth. The demons are bowing here and now. The winds are and waves are bowing here and now. Are you bowing before the King of kings and Lord of lords? Romans 1 Starting in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Greek. For the gospel reveals the righteousness of God that comes by faith from start to finish. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all of the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from His workmanship, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and darkened in their foolish hearts. Although they claimed to be wise, they were fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images of mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. 
Therefore God gave them over into the desires of their hearts to the impurity for the dishonoring of their bodies with each other. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was forever worthy of praise. Amen. I want to ask you a question after reading that. Who was in worse state on the other side of that lake? The two men that were demon oppressed or the town who was living fat and happy? Boy, if you don't get that out of the answer out of the story, then you're missing everything. And that man who was cured said, Jesus is my life. I will go report it to everywhere. And the disciples had to get back in that boat and go to the other side and say, what are we doing? Are we tell, living a lie or are we living the truth? How are we going to profess? Are we going to? If this was not a lesson for them, this is a pivotal, pivotal point in this gospel. Where is Jesus going? He's going to the least of these whether you go or not. So where is Jesus telling you to go? Are you more like the disciples? Are you more like the demon-possessed men? Are you more like the town? And I have to say probably if we were honest with ourselves in most churches, we're more like the town because we think we are okay which is just like most of the people that are religious at that time with Jesus. They think they're okay. But don't say your father is Abraham unless you have the faith of Abraham, who would take his son up on a mountain, raise the knife up to his chest before God said, don't do that. That's faith. I don't know what God is calling you to do in your life. I don't know any, any of that. I don't know what he's calling me to do most times. But that's why you get in the boat because you don't know what the journey's like. But if God tells you to go to the other side, you get in the boat. And if you have trouble along the way, you ask him to increase your faith. What is the real problem with the people? Not demonic activity, but a hardened heart. What do demons do? They fight a spiritual battle waging war against your soul. Why don't people believe? It's not your problem. Your problem is to be the messenger to plant the seed. But to live a life where they don't consider you a hypocrite or anything. Why did Jesus not allow the man to come? Because he had a mission field for him there at home. So I'm going to close with this. Where is Jesus asking you to go and take the gospel message? We're going to take communion as soon as I pray. And you can come up on your own and take communion. Share it with our kids. I'm so glad we have kids today, and I didn't know I was going to have them when I talked to you. So that's such a blessing. But don't take it in an unworthy manner because you are, we are doing this in remembrance of Jesus Christ, that he gave his body for us, that he poured out his blood for us. Life is in the blood. That this new covenant, this new testament that God holds firm to is written in the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. That all you've got to do is have faith. But remember, as James wrote and Jesus preached in the, so much in the Sermon on the Mount and everywhere else, that if you have faith, it's obvious by the deeds that you do. And that you're to love even your enemies. To have compassion on human beings because every human being matters to God a lot more than pigs and a lot more than other things. So as you come to take communion, spend time in prayer, bring your family. Remember that Jesus Christ gave this and we are doing this in remembrance of Him. Our King of kings and Lord of lords our master, master, our savior, and our friend. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all glory and praise and honor. We do thank you, Lord, that we can come freely in this country to worship you. Lord, help us to not take it for granted. Help us to constantly write on our door frames your laws and decrees, to establish them in our hearts, to teach them to our children. And Lord, to have compassion even on those that that we have deemed 
unsavable because we don't understand, not because we don't, don't see that they have worth or anything, but think they're maybe too far gone for what we're, what we're equipped with. But we're equipped with the gospel, and that's all we need because that's the power of salvation. If it's simply going to someone who we think doesn't understand and reading them some psalms, Lord, whatever you call us to do, help us to have faith to do it, help us to have the obedience to do it, Lord, to bow at your feet in worship. We thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross unashamed so that you could set us free from the penalty of our sins. And Lord, may we listen to you as a shepherd and overseer of our souls. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.